This video of the Norman Zepp Judith Varga collection of art by Inuit provides a small but intimate look at the artists we met in the Arctic and their works that we enthusiastically collected over a period of some 45 years, the first piece being acquired in 1969. Although we had the advantage of taking several Arctic trips between 1982 and 1992, during which time I interviewed and photographed several dozen artists, almost all of the works were acquired in the South from commercial galleries and auctions. Several of the pieces in our collection are historical, meaning pre-1945, but most are from the classic period of Inuit art, 1948 to 1995. During this period, the various regions and communities developed their own artistic styles, largely dependent on local history, southern influence, available materials, and the work of individual artists of note. The Kiwatin, now Kivalek, region always held a particular appeal. The sculpture of Mary Ayak seen in front of her RV at home, provides an excellent example of the aesthetic most associated with her community. Austere, unpolished greystone pieces with their simple, even minimal form echo the particularly harsh realities of traditional life of the Caribou Inuit living inland west of the Hudson Bay coast. Owing to the hard, unyielding nature of the stone itself, quite unlike the soft steatite soapstone of northern Quebec, fine naturalistic detail was not possible. Rather, facial features are generalized, appendages only suggested. The abstract nature of much of Arviat's sculpture has evoked thoughts of modern art by some collectors and writers, such as George Swinton. Perhaps also due to the tenuous nature of traditional life on the tundra, a favorite subject of Kivalik artists is the mother and children and the family group. A collecting focus of Judith's was Arviat artist Eva Taluki, who was influenced by her aunt to combine beads with stone. The treatment and form of the stone sculpture itself is not unlike that of Ayak and others in Arviat, such as Lucy Tassier. What is quite different and of special appeal is the combination of the unassuming gray stone with brightly colored beads to provide a striking contrast. The decorative use of cloth and beads when depicting the figures is a direct reference to the use of beads as clothing decoration by women of the South Kivalik, owing to the proximity of the Cree. In a 1992 trip to Arviat, we had a rewarding opportunity to see Taluki working in her home. Like that of his wife Ayak, much of the original shape of the stone is retained in Luke Anatolik's works. A fundamental characteristic of classic period art is the use and adaption of stone available from local quarries, often combined with organic materials such as antler, ivory, and bone. A caribou Inuit, Anatolik depicts humans while also paying homage to the animal upon which his people were totally dependent for the necessities of life. 
tools, clothing, food and shelter. The use of actual antlers in this piece reinforces this connection. The natural shape of antler limits the formal options available. However, in the hands of these creative individuals, a dancing drum dance figure is cleverly depicted. An outlook is seen outside his house in the summer of 1992 showing us his pile of caribou antlers. An Arviat artist who preferred using antler and who often featured the caribou is Jacob Urquhart. His depiction of two charging caribou is spirited and most convincing. Urquhart is seen here in a 1969 photo by Swinton, holding a work very similar to that in this collection. Urquhart's single caribou is simply divine. The caribou was a favorite subject and became a major collecting focus. We were able to obtain over 40 different renderings of the caribou by many of the North's finest artists and thus show the many varied and unique interpretations possible with a common subject. One artist who is most famous for his caribous is Oshuitik Aipili, who, when interviewed, spoke of his admiration and love of this noble beast. Working with the striking green serpentinite of the South Baffin region, this renowned artist produces works featuring the elegance and flamboyance of much Cape Dorset art. Unless forced indoors due to winter cold, artists prefer to work out of doors due to the hazard of breathing stone dust. For much of the classic period, artists employed files, hacksaws, hatchets, and hand drills. Oshuitik is shown in 1991 using these along with the now common power tools. In contrast to Oshuitik, Repulse Bay artist Mark Tungalik's caribou is smaller, more compact, and self-contained, a feature of Repulse. Tungalik carved many fine examples of people and animals using local stone, but this Central Arctic community is best known for ivory carvings derived from the tusks of the walrus which congregate nearby.
Tunglik in particular is renowned for his miniatures, composed of tiny people, animals, and landscapes. These photos of Tungalik were taken in 1982 during a research trip for my master's paper titled Contemporary Inuit Art, Acculturation and Ethnicity. He is shown holding impossibly small ivory works and the miniature files he used. Tungalik told me how his fingers would be filed raw as he held on to the pieces. The communities of Joe Haven, located on King William Island, south of the site of the abandoned Franklin ships, and Taloyoak, are in proximity to what once were large piles of whalebone left on the shore by the 19th century whalers. Through the use of bone, the sculpture from the Kitikmiat region is typified by dynamic, highly expressive pieces. As seen with Judas Ululik's dog, this organic medium often appears to exude an inner life of its own, not possible with stone. During a 1991 research trip to the Kitakmiat region, Judith and I were taken on a long, harried ride in a Kamatik over melting Arctic waters to Ululik's summer camp. We were north of the Arctic Circle, and Ululik was carving at 1 o'clock in the morning on a July night. He informed us that he was only carving a huge white dancing bear to take advantage of the commercial popularity of this image, which he felt he could do as well as anyone. Images arising from traditional spiritual beliefs are common with the art of the Inuit. And this is particularly true of Nick Sikawak, who drew upon his knowledge of traditional beliefs in spirits, shamans, and mysterious forces beyond man's control for his inspiration. Sikawak's shaman fishing spirit uses antler, fur, and sinew in a most creative, even unsettling manner. Sikawak, one of the most unforgettable artists I met, is shown in his summer tent outside of Pelly Bay preparing a meal for Judith and I. We were camping nearby. The Zepbarger collection is largely a sculpture collection, but wall hangings and prints and drawings are nevertheless notable components. One of the North's best known and most prolific graphic artists was Simon Takumi. He is seen working in his studio, set up in a room in his Baker Lake bungalow. Like many Inuit, Takumi was generous with his time and always ready to share a joke. Takumi is also shown carving outdoors on a cold day in May 1990. It is interesting to note that even his sculpture which he did occasionally, is often quite flat, almost two-dimensional, dependent on line and simple form 
for its aesthetic appeal. This video presents a small sample of the art produced from across the Arctic by highly creative individuals. Judith and I have found that at their best, the works are satisfying in themselves as objects, and at the same time, embody many of the cultural forces, past and present, that constitute the special form, flavor, and impact of the Canadian Inuit experience. <laughs>